Okay, can you see that? Yeah. yeah great. Okay, so yeah, uh, year one MSK revision session. Um, obviously, I can't cover everything. Um, you know, I can't condense three weeks of lectures into an hour, but I'm going to try and focus on some key topics, uh, specifically for your kind of, you know, your summative exam, but obviously, or more like hopefully, uh, it should be useful for your end of block. Um, I finished the PowerPoint last night and had a look today and realised it might be a bit of information overload. So if you feel like I'm trying to cover too much, I'm sorry, but um, I know it's been recorded, but I will kind of provide the slides as well to the Muna. Uh, so hopefully you should be able to access them later uh, on somewhere. So yeah, so if, if it runs over slightly, I'm sorry, but I'm going to try and keep it within the hour. So the second point I was going to make is that uh, I may ask some questions throughout the session, um, but you know, I'm not expecting anyone to answer, you know, if you're just all lying in bed, fine. Um, I just kind of give you a few moments to kind of think about it before, before moving on. Uh, so yeah, first topic, um, anatomy, and you know, a lot of you may kind of roll your eyes when when you think of anatomy. Um, you know, for those of you that are happy to go through every single muscle in you know your Gray's Anatomy books, you know, fine, keep doing that. But you know, anatomy is a very time-consuming subject. You know, there's a lot to get through, especially when you've got so much else to be doing. Um, so we're going to try and focus on, you know, some key areas, uh, you know, which, which will hopefully help you, help in your revision. So with that in mind, so your wrist flexors, they're all going to come from, uh, your medial epicondyle. Well, a lot of them will be. Um, so, you know, if, if you actually flex your wrist, you can actually feel them contracting. And you actually just that we, do, we are telling you the most. Sorry. <laughs> um, if you actually flex your wrist, you can you can feel, you know, if you just palpate over the medial epicondyle, you can feel it. So, you know, if you're in an exam situation and you're wondering, oh, does it does wrist flexes come from medial or, or lateral epicondyle? You know, just, just have a feel on yourself, flex your wrist and you'll feel it. Um, yeah, and basically looking ahead a year, but, um, you know, jumping ahead slightly, but if you think about golfer's elbow, so if you press on the medial epicondyle area and you have the patient flex their wrist against tension to elicit the pain, uh, you, you'll elicit pain and know that this is where the trauma and inflammation is. I feel like my slides are slightly delayed, so you might be able to see this. Oh, I don't think the pictures are coming up. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, just using one of these flexors as an example. So the flexor carpi radialis, for example, it's coming from the uh, it, it's it's cross it, it's coming from the medial epicondyle, as I've said, and it's crossing over to the lateral side. So if you think about that, it's crossing over to the lateral side. So we already know it's causing wrist flexion. But if you think about that muscle contracting, because it's on the lateral side, it's going to cause abduction as well. And then if we use the same principle, the flexor carpi ulnaris is actually going to flex the wrist still, but cause adduction because it's staying on that medial side. Pronator muscles, I'm so sorry. I don't think, are the pictures coming through or not? No, I don't think so. I don't know why that is. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, sorry about that. You're just gonna have to listen to me talk. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about that, sorry. But anyway, the, the pronator muscles, the, if you remember, you've got your pronator teres and your pronator quadratus. Just know which one's which. Pronator teres is more um, anterior, uh, sorry, more proximal. And your pronator quadratus is uh, more distal. Uh, muscle insertion uh, and it's actually the most distal most muscle insertion on the anterior aspect of the radius that sounds complicated it's not as complicated as, you know, as, as it sounds it's just you know the muscle that's furthest down the arm on the anterior compartment um, you then obviously got your supernatal muscles 
So obviously this will include your supernasal, that, that one should be pretty self-explanatory. But also you've got your biceps brachii, uh, which is actually the most powerful forearm supernasal. So you think if people are doing this pose, you know, they're trying to flex the biceps, they're actually supernating their wrist to really kind of peak the bicep. Uh, yeah. And then if we move on to our extensors, um, a lot of the extensors, so whereas your wrist flexors are coming from the medial epicondyle, the wrist extensors are coming from the lateral epicondyle. So basically, once again, jumping ahead slightly uh, into second year more, but it, it helps, I think, understand you know, what's going on. If you think about tennis elbow, people are going to get pain over the lateral epicondyle, um, and then pain if you kind of extend the wrist against resistance because obviously your extensors are coming from this area and you know that that, that, that guy playing tennis is nicely demonstrating tennis elbow um, you know getting pain over that lateral epicondyle where the extensors insert um, and people will actually often present uh, you know clutching their arm like this and I, I have actually seen this in the GP practice so that's kind of um, wrist flexors um <laughs> this slide doesn't really help because there's meant to be a, a really good summary table and it's just not showing at all so uh, yeah this is a bit of a pain isn't it um i don't know what to do about that sorry <laughs> but but yeah so i try and oh has it come through now yeah yeah sorry about that uh, so I've talked about wrist flexion and wrist extension, uh, but this is actually a good summary table about flexion and extension of the elbow. And if you just go down the list, some of them are pretty obvious, but I think if you can just kind of go through this table and just kind of try and fill in the blanks, uh, it, it, it might be quite useful to just in your own revision. Um, so obviously just going down that list, you know, um, if we look at kind of, Triceps is obviously going to cause extension, but you're also going to get the anconius, which also causes extension. Uh, and it's actually quite an interesting muscle because it also prevents hyperextension as well. And then if you just kind of look at that list, just a quick question, um, you're getting kind of your brachialis and biceps brachii, which are kind of causing flexion of the arm. But does anyone know of another muscle in the anterior compartment that is innervated by the muscular tenus nerve that also causes like flexion at the shoulder? Is it the cracobrachialis? It is. Well done. <laughs> yeah. So cracobrachialis. So that's going to cause flexion of the shoulder and adduction as well. So that was a bit speedy. Have I lost anyone so far? No, does that all make sense? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, it doesn't help that the actual images aren't showing up. So, yeah, I apologize about that. So, that's kind of the, the wrist and the elbow. And then, obviously, you've got your shoulder. So, I would actually spend more time going through the shoulder because there are a lot more movements. Um, so, it, it is worth kind of going over. Uh, and it's also a good, good area for them to kind of ask questions about, um, just because there's a lot, a lot going on. So once again, if we just kind of work down this list again, uh, some of them are fairly easy, you know, flexion of the shoulder, you're going to get, uh, obviously, part of your deltoid is going to do that, but also your pectoralis major. Um, because basically, your pectoralis major is inserting into the intubercular groove or the bicepital groove, as it says there. So, you know, if you think about benching in the gym, uh, you know, you're going to be flexing that shoulder. Uh, and it also does a bit of adduction as well. And then crocobrachialis, as we just mentioned, uh, that's also inserting on that kind of anterior medial side, the surface of the humerus, and it's causing kind of uh, flexion and adduction of the shoulder once again. Now looking at kind of extension, once again, your kind of um, your deltoid is gonna be doing this. Um, 
but also your latissimus dorsi as well. So the latissimus dorsi is inserting onto into the same place that your pectoralis major inserts to, so onto the intertubercular groove. But if you think the latissimus dorsi is on the posterior surface, so it's going to cause extension as opposed to you know flexion. So you know if you think about going to the gym and you're doing some dumbbell rowing, as shown there, uh, you're working those lats. So you know you're extending at the shoulder. Uh, so yeah, sorry to sound a bit like a personal trainer. But it's just useful to kind of kind of see it like this. And then just working down again. So the rotator cuff, I actually think it's quite useful to know the insertion. So I know it's more information for you to know, you know, you learn the muscle, then you learn the insertion and the origin. But if you know the insertion of some of the muscles, you can kind of visualize, um, you, you can visualize what the action of the muscle is actually doing. So three of your rotator cuffs, so your supraspinatus, your infraspinatus, and teres minor are all going to insert onto the greater tubercle of the humerus. So if you think about the actions that that's going to cause, it, um, it's going to cause uh, lateral, lateral rotation, isn't it? Yeah. And then because of the position of the supraspinatus, it's slightly higher up it's also going to abduct the humerus as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I think, I think it's just useful to know that. So obviously you've got your greater tubercle on your humerus, which is on the more posterior side. So if you can just kind of visualize where the muscle is actually uh, attaching to and visualize what happens when that contracts, you can visualize what happens to the humerus. Yeah, I think that helps anyway. Um, so your supraspinatus is going to do your first 15 degrees of abduction and then your deltoid takes over after that. And then, as mentioned, your infraspinatus and teres minor are going to be doing kind of external or lateral rotation. So then the subscapularis um, is actually going to insert into the lesser tubercle on the anterior surface. So if you think on the posterior surface, they were inserting onto the greater tubercle. So when they contract, it causes a lateral rotation because this is on the anterior surface and inserting into the lesser tubercle, it's gonna cause internal rotation or medial rotation. Um, yeah. And that's gonna be along with the lats, again, as mentioned, uh, terrace major and anterior deltoid. So yeah, the, the deltoid uh, does a bit of everything really. Um, it does flexion, extension, internal rotation, lateral rotation, abduction. Uh, so the only thing it doesn't really do is adduction. Uh, but I mean, it probably does do a bit of adduction somewhere. I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's, the, so yeah, deltoid is kind of involved in the process. But if you can know some of the more specifics of the muscles and, you know, if you just go through a table like this and just kind of write out flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, and just try and, you know, think of what muscles are involved in each section. Uh, I think it might be quite useful as opposed to just kind of, you know, going, scrolling through your, your Gray's anatomy cards and, you know, learning each muscle individually and then each insertion. You know, if you can kind of know the groups of muscles that are doing the, the different um, functions, uh, I, I think that's more useful. The other thing about the upper limb, so in exam questions, they often kind of, for some reason, uh, it, when I was doing first year exams, they asked a lot about kind of uh, carpal bones and x-rays. So just kind of know your carpal bones. Uh, I'm sure if you've had Paul from Hark, you know, you've seen straight lines, you think here comes the thumb. Uh, but, you know, you could also kind of see like the capitate is like the capital. So it's like the more central carpal bone. And then if you also know like the hamate has got like a bit of a hook on it as well. Uh, yeah, so just something to be aware of. Maybe just revise your carpal bones and look at an x-ray and try and, you know, work out which one's which. And another thing that they sometimes ask about is the anatomical snuff box. Um, so if you haven't heard of it, you know, make sure you just know what it is. Uh, and basically you can often kind of palpate your scaphoid or uh, 
the trapezium also forms the floor of the snuff box as well. Okay, so lower limb. Um, just kind of a few kind of, I'll, I'll just mention a few key areas. So your quadriceps, obviously like your rectus femoris, and then your, your vastus muscles, they're gonna be flexing the hip and also extending at the knee. Um, your rectus femoris in particular, and then your vastus muscles are gonna be extending the knee. Uh, sartorius muscle is actually quite unique because it's a hip and knee flexor, and that's partly due to the length of the muscle. Uh, it's, as it says, there's the longest muscle in the body. Um, so it's actually going below the knee. So it's able to actually flex the knee, as you can see from that bottom diagram, because the diagrams are now working. Um, you can see that when the knee's in that bent position, that when the sartorius contracts, it's obviously gonna bring you know, the leg down. So it's gonna also be able to flex the knee, as opposed to your quadriceps, which are extending the knee. Also just the fact to maybe be aware of, um, you know, uh, it forms part of like the pes and serenus. So they could mention this, I doubt they will, but basically if you're just aware of it, um, it's basically the sartorius muscle, gracilis and semitendinosus, uh, all kind of join into one tendon to insert onto, you know, that particular part of the tibia. Uh, did someone have a question then? At all? No? Okay. Uh, abductors, hopefully pretty obvious. They adduct. Um, so just know which ones are, you know, which ones they are, but pretty self-explanatory. They have the word adductor in the name. Uh, and then your glutes. So your glutes. So your gluteus maximus is going to cause extension an external rotation of the hip, whereas your gluteus medius and minimus are the main abductors of the hip. So don't, don't get confused with that. Don't think like, because it's gluteus medius, um, it's not the main abductor, it is the main abductor. Your gluteus maximus is doing more extension and external rotation. And I'll come back to kind of gluteus medius and minimus later when I kind of talk about Trendel and Mergate. So then gastrocnemius and soleus or soleus, however you want to pronounce that. So gastrocnemius, as you can see, um, attaches above the knee. So it can actually cause knee flexion. And obviously it also causes plantar flexion, uh, which is it's kind of uh, one of its main functions. But actually, when the knee is in a bent position, if you think, the gastrocnemius is inserting above the knee. So if your knee's bent, the gastrocnemius isn't gonna be uh, taut or you know, flexed. Um, so actually it's not gonna be that powerful, a plantar flexor, because you know, the muscle see is quite loose. Um, so your soleus is actually the most powerful plantar flexor when the knee is bent. It's sometimes called like uh, the gear muscle or something, because if, if you're on a bike, and uh, you're kind of pressing down, yeah, something like that. <laughs> you can look that up. So then inversion of the foot, that's currently saying eversion, hold on. There we go. Sorry, I'm having real trouble with my slides tonight. Uh, so inversion of the foot, it's actually quite a good one to remember because it's both, it's from two compartments. So it's just your tibialis muscles. So if you think tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior, they're both gonna cause inversion. So if you see a question in an exam talking about kind of inversion of the foot, tibialis, you know, one of the tibialis muscles, uh, but just obviously know that tibialis anterior, it's in the anterior compartment, so it's gonna cause dorsiflexion as well. And the tibialis posterior is gonna cause plantar flexion because it's in the, you know, the posterior compartment. And then eversion. So if you think your tibialis muscles cause an inversion, think fibularis muscles causing eversion. Um, you might see uh, fibularis muscles called perineal as well. So it might be perineal longus. Don't get confused. So make sure you're just aware of that. Fibularis can be perineal as well. And they're causing eversion. Don't really want to say any more about it than that. Uh, and then stabilizers of the knee. So 
you have primary and secondary. Um, if it says primary, you're thinking about ligaments. Yeah, because they, they're going to be your main stabilizers of the knee. And, you know, I think many times people often get confused about, you know, what, what actually is each ligament doing. You know, they confuse ACL and PCL. So just think ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, is resisting anterior displacement of the tibia. Yeah. PCL, posterior cruciate ligament, is resisting posterior displacement of the tibia. It's kind of the opposite way around for MCL and LCL. So the medial collateral ligament is resisting lateral movement of the tibia and the lateral collateral ligament is resisting medial movement of the tibia. So after the session or whenever, it might just be worth just, you know, making sure you wrap your heads around what actually each ligament is doing. Um, yeah. And then if you see a question talking about, oh, missed a slide. No, I haven't. Never mind. Um, just the other point. So it might also be helpful when you're thinking about ACL and PCL if you actually, so if you look at the diagram in the top right there, um, as you can see, if you're testing for an ACL injury, if you can move the tibia too far forward, you know, you've probably damaged your ACL. Whereas you can, if you can move your tibia too far, you know, posteriorly, probably damaged your PCL. So, you know, just, just get your head around that because it does confuse people sometimes. And then when you think of the secondary stabilizers of the knee, uh, you think of the surrounding muscles. So if a question says about, you know, secondary stabilizers of the knee, uh, just pick the one that says muscle. Uh, obviously don't pick it, you know, pick you know, latissimus dorsi, it's talking about, you know, secondary stabilizers of the knee, but yeah, hopefully you get the point. Uh, so your menisci as well. Um, so your menisci connected by transverse ligament. Uh, don't forget that bit. Um, they serve as shock absorbers and they also help to kind of stabilize the knee. Uh, the medial one is more C-shaped or crescent shaped and the lateral one is, you know, more circular. Uh, even though the medial one is, is bigger, it's often damaged more. So, you know, just be aware of that. And I think you may have seen in your lectures that they're involved in proprioception as well. Uh, yeah, could be wrong, but that, that's, I vaguely remember that. And then when you're thinking about limbs, you know, gait cycle often kind of uh, crops up. They like asking about it. So just make sure, you know, people can skip over it, but just make sure you're aware of the gait cycle. So, you know, um, and know when, two legs are on the ground kind of thing and when you just get in single support so know that you know with double support it's when you first have initial contact and the loading response and pre-swing as well and then when you've just got one leg with contact when you've got single support it's when you're mid stance which hopefully makes sense and uh, terminal stance as well so just just make sure you go through that um, and remember that the cycle is following the one leg through the whole process. So it's the initial contact of that one leg, then the loading response of that leg, mid stance and so on. In exams as well, don't forget about the vertebral column. So, you know, you, you're spending all this time going through all these muscles, your flexors, your extensors and so on. Um, but for some reason in our exams, they asked a lot about kind of vertebral column. So make sure you know your ligaments, um, you know, supraspinous, interspinous, ligamentum flavum, which is what you kind of you feel when you do a lumbar puncture. Uh, you get like a second pop, and that's kind of you're going through the ligamentum flavum into the spinal cord. Um, so yeah, know your ligaments, and then also know about the kind of vertebral body and its constituents. So they're in the bottom uh, right. You know, make sure you know the difference between your lamina and your pedicle as well know which one's which because that can be quite confusing and it's quite hard to remember never really thought of a way to remember it just got to brute force it so yeah <laughs> and also just know about uh you know your annulus fibrosis and your nu nu nucleus pulposus so your annulus fibrosis is going to prevent over rotation of the vertebra and if you get a slip disc or anything like that that's when the nucleus pulposus is going to herniate out of the annulus. Um, 
And that's when people can get things like sciatica and things like that. Okay, quick question. Does anyone know what level the spinal cord ends? Don't have to answer. It's all right. Yeah, well done, Aiden. It's uh, L1 to L2. Um, so this is obviously where your kind of chorus um, medullaris is. Uh, this is termination of spinal cord, which is often why when you're doing lumbar puncture, you go around the L3 to L4 region, because you know, obviously you don't want to be going near the, um, the spinal cord. Anesthetists can go higher, but I mean, I think, you know, foundation level, you're going to be L3, L4. Which needs, leads nicely onto nerves. Um, so, you know, anatomy is a big topic um, and, you know, it can be quite confusing. There's a lot of just learning different things um, and the same can be said with nerves really. So, you know, when you look at the brachial plexus, is this the most useful way to kind of learn all the nerves? You know, if you're fine just kind of looking at this diagram and reading it all and taking it in, you know, that's okay, continue to do that. I think there's like a quiz on Sporkle. If you've heard of Sporkle, just type in like Sporkle brachial quiz and you can just quiz yourself and you can go through this diagram a few times and you'll get all the nerves. Um, but is this the most kind of relevant for what you need? Probably not. I mean, you know, know the basics, route C5 to T1, but, but the key nerves that you need to know about in first year, are, you know, muscular, cutaneous, radial, median, and ulna. So this is just a nice kind of uh, summary of all the nerves. Um, as I say, you'll have access to these slides, hopefully after this session. So you can just kind of go through this. Uh, and basically, if you, if you learn this table, and um, you know, you should be able to cope with most questions that, you, that will be thrown your way. Um, because, you know, a lot of the nerves, they innovate particular compartments. So if you know what muscles are in those compartments, you're going to know which, you know, nerve is innovating that muscle. Obviously, there are exceptions to the rule. Um, I'll go through one of them in a minute. There always are exceptions. But, you know, general principles, th this covers a lot of what you need. So to just kind of go through some of that. So the muscular cutaneous nerve, uh, as briefly mentioned before, it's going to cause shoulder flexion. Um, injury to the muscular cutaneous nerve on its own is quite rare. I think you have to have quite a bad trauma to, to just damage the kind of muscular cutaneous nerve. But for the purpose of learning, you know, if you damage the muscular cutaneous nerve, you're obviously going to get weakness in elbow and shoulder flexion. You're going to get atrophy of the biceps brachii. And uh, you might also get pain in the lateral forearm because the muscular cutaneous nerve obviously has a, remember these nerves have motor and sensory function. So for the muscular cutaneous nerve, that's going to be in you know, the lateral forearm, as you can see on that lower right diagram. And you might get pain or paresthesia. For the radial nerve, so think radial nerve, you're thinking extension or, you know, it's innovating the extensors. So if you think if someone has damage to the radial nerve, they no longer have extension. So you're going to get unopposed flexion, which is why you'll see wrist drop because you get inflection of the wrist. Um, so this is an example, assassinate palsy. If people kind of, uh, you know, drunk or whatever and have the you know, arm over the chair uh, all evening, you're going to get compression of the radial nerve and you're going to get wrist drop. Uh, which I think takes a you know a few months to to get over. So yeah, it's it's not a small thing. Um, and then median nerve. So the the two most confusing nerves I would say are median and ulna. And I think sometimes there are a few confusing elements between the two. But hopefully, I mean I've not done a very good job so far. But but hopefully I'll try and kind of uh, it, s explain and simplify and clarify the differences. So the median nerve, uh, its motor innovation is the loaf muscles. So the loaf muscles um, are basically, you know, they innovate your, your thena eminence. So your thumb, basically your thumb area, um, but not mentioned in that table. They also, uh, the median nerve also uh, innovates some of your flexor muscles. 
And the particular one I want to focus on is the Flexor Digitorum Fundus, because this is only partly innovated by the median nerve and then partly innovated by the ulnar nerve, which is why sometimes, you know, partly why ulnar and median nerve, it, it gets a bit confusing. So just kind of talking about the Flexor Digitorum Profundus. So um, your median nerve innovates the lateral part of the flexor digitorum profundus. So it's gonna to lead to kind of help with flexion of the second and third digits, whereas your ulnar nerve is gonna uh, innovate the medial part of that muscle. So your fourth and fifth digits. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm moving on anyway, so yeah. Um, it might help to, to visualize this diagram. So if, if you're thinking about it, uh, the green area is your ulnar nerve. So obviously this is the more medial part. I know it's lateral on that diagram, but if you think about uh, you know, the anatomical position, the hands are usually the other way around. So the green area is, is using medial. If you think about kind of supinating your hands um, uh, and that's innervated by the ulnar nerve and then the median nerve is obviously the blue area. So if you think your, your fourth and fifth digits Going to be innervated by your ulnar nerve and then the others are going to be innervated by your median nerve. So with that in mind, if you kind of see this, firstly like what is it and what uh, pathology and what nerve is causing it? Does anyone know? That may be carpal tunnel syndrome where um, it compresses the median nerve. Yeah, yeah, spot on. Yeah, it is. So hopefully this is just trying to demonstrate my point of the area where the median nerve is innervating. So as you can see, the where the arrows are pointing to, you've actually got muscle wasting or thena wasting or thena atrophy uh, because, you know, the median nerve is no longer innervating this area. So, you know, when you think about median nerve, you should be thinking about you know, kind of thena muscles. Yeah, so yeah, well done, Ollie. Uh, so then the ulnar nerve. So obviously, as I've said, the median nerve innervates your loaf muscles. Um, so actually your ulnar nerve, I said that right, didn't I? Yeah, loaf muscles, median nerve, ulnar nerve, the rest of the intrinsic hand muscles, and that it's also involved in wrist flexion. So, the other confusing part about the, yeah, there we go. The other confusing part about the, okay, so sorry, the loaf muscles, that is an acronym, and now you're really testing me um, because it stands for four, uh, four different muscles. It's like the lumbricals, uh, opponents, uh, obductor something. You'd have to look them up, but, but basically, if you understand, it's the, uh, know them as the loaf muscles and you know know that it's innervating the thena area um but, but yeah look it up if you, if you want to know more details <laughs> so yeah so uh nerve lesions so i'm not sure have you come across this so claw hand and hand of benediction and all that no i think it was covered briefly yeah briefly okay yeah so this can be quite uh i just Go over it then. So this can be quite a confusing area. So if you ignore the wrist drop part, because that's your radial nerve, you should all know that now. Um, if you look at claw hand and hand of benediction, they actually look quite similar, don't they? Because you appear to be getting kind of flexion of the fourth and fifth digits in both, but, but actually it's completely two different mechanisms. So this is quite a busy slide, um, but you know, to summarize, you know, your lumbricals innervated by your ulnar nerve usually cause flexion of your MCP joint. And this is at the level of the knuckle. So if you think if the ulnar nerve isn't working, this flexion isn't gonna be there anymore. So you're gonna get unopposed extension. So if you actually look at that figure, uh, you should be able to see that, you know, you're getting hyperextension at the muscle, uh, at the knuckle, sorry. And then if you look further up, confusingly, these lumbricals also cause uh, extension higher up at the interphalangeal joints. 
So if you think uh, flexion isn't working here at the knuckle, so you're getting hyperextension and extension isn't working here, so you're appearing to get flexion. So, so that's your owner claw. Um, but the main thing to remember is you'll see this at rest uh, when someone just presents to you, that they'll, they'll have this presentation or when asked to, for people to extend their fingers. Whereas in um, median nerve, if you think the ulnar area is unaffected, so when someone's asked to flex their fingers, they can flex their fourth and fifth, but they can't flex, um, you know, the first three digits because you know, that's where the, the median nerve usually innovates. Does that make sense? Yeah. So obviously, if you want to kind of wrap your head around this, you know, if you can't tell already, that table above is from Wikipedia. Uh, so just have a look and look at the differences. Yeah. And then also, you know, your media, if you're thinking about your median nerve, you're not going to be able to oppose your thumb. Because once again, think about, your, think about the thumb thena area when you're thinking about median nerve, so you can't oppose or abduct the thumb. And you also might be able to do the OK sign. <laughs> yeah, so just remember that. Lower limb nerves, don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, but in summary, once again, here's the end of the table that I'll give um, access to. Uh, so just quickly going through them. Femoral nerve, think about your quadriceps. It's going to cause knee extension and thigh flexion. Uh, you may also see saphenous nerve, which is a continuation of the femoral nerve. Uh, and it's the sensory branch. So as you can see from that uh, blue diagram, it's sensory to the you know, anterior medial and posterior medial compartment. Uh, so yeah, if we see saphenous nerve, it's a continuation of the femoral nerve, basically. So just another question. So foot drop, if you, if you hear about foot drop, do you know what nerve you'd be thinking of? Would it be the sciatic nerve? Because that's the one that innovates the leg, but I can't remember. Yeah, basically you are right. So in the sense of your sciatic nerve is the overall nerve, yeah? But actually, uh, specifically, it's your common perineal nerve. Um, so to just, just explain this, it is your sciatic nerve, so you're right, that's well worked out. But your sciatic nerve branches, so the two main branches, are your tibial nerve and your common fibular nerve. Your tibial nerve is gonna cause inversion and plantar flexion. And as you can see, uh, you know, this is easy to remember because the tibial nerve stays on the posterior side. So if it's innervating the posterior muscles, it's gonna, you know, innervate the light to gastrocnemius, which is gonna to lead to, you know, plantar flexion. Whereas your common fibular nerve, um, that, has two branches, superficial and deep. The superficial is going to cause eversion, and then the deep branch is going to cause dorsiflexion because the deep branch actually goes round to the anterior compartment. So you think often in kind of sports injuries, so people have like you know studs to their knee or something, um, they're going to damage the common fibular nerve. So you know you're not going to get. Um, innovation of dorsiflexion so you're going to get unopposed plantar flexion so you're going to get foot drop basically if you see foot drop think common perineal or common fibular nerve and then just the word about trendelenburg gait why isn't that there we go so often due to kind of superior gluteal nerve or kind of a lesion to the you know fifth lumbar spine um, so as I pre previously talked about, it's your gluteus medius and glute gluteus minimus that are doing abduction. So if you think about it, if you have, just a quick question, if you have kind of, um, if your left hip is dropping, are your abductors affected on the left side or the right side? In Trendelenburg gate. The right side because they're the ones that are 
as we pull it up. Yeah, exactly. So if you just think of uh, abduction, if you see it like a lever, so the abduction is going to occur on the opposite side to kind of pull the hip up. I know that's not a very medical term, uh, but it's, it's abducting to stop the hip dropping on the other side. Yeah. So that's Trendelenburg gait. So if you see someone's hip dropping on one side, the actual abnormality is going to be on the other side. So just a bit about connective tissue. Um, I'm sorry that was a lot of anatomy and, you know, I'm sorry if, if a lot of that was confusing or, you know, but hopefully, as I say, you can go through the slides after uh, and just kind of work through them. You know, it's a lot to take in. It's a big topic. It's a heavy topic. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you got something from that, you know, I know that wasn't very well explained. It's my first time doing this, so I do apologize. I know that wasn't great. Um, but yeah, hopefully you took something from it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, tendons versus ligaments, make sure you just know the difference. So tendons, bone to muscle, ligaments, bone to bone. Um, you know, in tendons, you get more parallel fibers, ligaments, it's a bit more messed up. Um, but also be aware that for both tendons and ligaments, you're thinking about type one collagen. So type one collagen, remember that. Um, so yeah, collagen, they seem to love collagen in your exams as well. We got, you know, a fairly big question, like five marks in our end of year exam. So it's definitely useful. Um, when thinking about, uh, you know, just making sure you're familiar with the collagens or some of, there's the first five listed. Um, but, you know, I'd say the key facts to know are, so when you think about type one collagen, you're thinking about bone, tendons, and ligaments. For type two collagen, you're thinking about cartilage. And then for type three collagen, uh, this is actually the collagen that's laid down first after healing of fractures. Uh, this is just kind of something that, in my experience, has come up on exams before. So it's, it's just useful to kind of uh, make sure you go through and that you're aware of. And then, yeah, once again, collagen formation, you know, it's, it's a complicated topic, really. Uh, but if you just know some basic facts, you know, collagen composed of three chains. Um, it's synthesized both, both intracellularly and extracellularly. Uh, so basically an, in, um, an immature protein is secreted and then it's kind of cleaved extracellularly. Um, so just know that and also know that vitamin C is involved with some of the enzymes for making collagen. And then just a bit more about cartilage. So as I've said, you're thinking cartilage, type two collagen, bone, type one. Um, and also know, you know, what collagen consists of. So it's the proteoglycans as well. So make sure you have proteoglycans. Uh, so these are negatively charged. So they're gonna attract water poly, uh, molecules. And it's these kind of water molecules that are helping the cartilage to do its job basically to help resist compression. And yeah, so this funny thing at the end, so arcades of Benninghoff, uh, this was just kind of thrown in one of our exams. I can't remember, and I don't think they covered it. They might've covered it in your lectures, but just be aware that collagen is organized into these kind of loops effectively or arcades uh, in articular cartilage. So if you see arcades of Benninghoff, it's probably gonna be the answer. So, you know, just click it, <laughs> um, but yeah just something to be aware of and then this is just kind of a nice table summary um, of some of the things talked about and then bone so two main forms of bone formation let's try and get those slides up there we go um, so intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. So if you see intramembranous, think mesenchymal condensation. Uh, this is the main thing you, you wanna be thinking about. <laughs> you can go into more depth if you want, but you know, it, it gets a bit confusing, I, I think. Uh, but not many bones are formed by intramembranous ossification, mainly like 
those in, in, in your kind of uh, head. So, you know, your mandible, your maxilla, and some of your skull bones, like your frontal and parietal. So, you know, just be aware of the kind of few muscles that actually occur by intramembranous ossification. Uh, but, you know, the main method of bone formation is endochondral ossification, which is a nice, uh, pretty diagram up there. Uh, and basically you're replacing hyaline car cartilage with bony tissue. Um, so yeah, when you're thinking about bone formation, just think about, obviously you think about your osteoblasts, which are involved with you know, bone matrix formation, and then your osteoclasts are obviously for bone resorption. Uh, so more involved in kind of bone remodeling. Uh, and then your osteocytes are obviously kind of uh, old osteoblasts that have got trapped. Um, and, and if you're just kind of thinking of them as responding to the loading on bone, so basically, if there's any stress placed on the bone, the, the osteocytes are going to release a load of cytokines to kind of, you know, trigger the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts to, re, to remodel the bone. Um, don't be confused by some of these diagrams. If you, it's the best one I could find to just explain to the top one. So on osteopetrosis, ignore that bit. I just want to focus on saying that, you know, osteocytes, they secrete, how do they work? You know, they're secreting HCL effectively, so hydrochloric acid. Uh, so, you know, hydrogen ions and chloride ions, um, which are helping to break down the bone. And also cathepsin K, you might see cathepsin K sometimes, and this is breaking down collagen. Uh, and then that's just a bit more on osteocytes. But basically what I've said, you know, osteocytes are to do with, you know, uh, responding to stress on the bone. So then your epiphysis. So this is obviously the site of bone growth. And unfortunately, uh, I would recommend you know, going through this because we did actually get a question on it in second year after not touching it for a year. So make sure you just know about it. Uh, so basically, you know, this is all to do with uh, chondrocytes. So be careful not to confuse kind of chondrocytes with uh, osteocytes. Um, so, you know, and just know that, you know, the four zones. So reserve zone, basically nothing's happening. Then, you know, these chondrocytes are proliferating. Then, you know, the growing in the, hyper, the hypertrophic zone and then calcifying. And then you're getting kind of ossification further down. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I just be aware of it because it, it did come up in, in our second year exam. So obviously the same thing happened to you. And then finally, I just want to kind of talk briefly about calcium and phosphate regulation. Um, so calcium regulation, what, what you might always grasp from the lectures because they're kind of talking about all the different hormones is that you know, the main hormones you need to know about uh, or, you know, the main things involved with calcium regulation is PTH, so parathyroid hormone, and vitamin D. You know, you may see calcitonium mentioned, but it actually has quite a minor role, which, you know, might have been emphasized in some of your lectures. So, you know, the main, you know, things involved in calcium and phosphate regulation are PTH and vitamin D. So parathyroid hormone works at the level of bone and kidneys. Um, its main actions are kind of increased osteoclast activity. So you're going to get kind of um, breakdown of bone, which is going to release calcium and phosphate into the bloodstream. Um, and then it's also gonna act on the distal convoluted tubercle in the kidneys, where it's gonna increase the reabsorption of calcium, but, um, and also increase the excretion of phosphate. Um, and its third action is to kind of upregulate one alpha hydroxylase, uh, but basically it increases the activity of vitamin D. Um, so, the other confusing part I would say is, you know, parathyroid hormone is causing a release of phosphate into the bloodstream because it's breaking down bone, but also it's excreting phosphate. So be aware that you actually get a slightly, it's a small met drop in uh, phosphate, serum phosphate levels um, in regards to, you know, when parathyroid hormone is acting. Yeah, so just to zoom in on kind of osteoclast activity, what actually is parathyroid hormone doing to cause that? Uh, I'm sure you've come across rank ligand and receptor uh, in your lectures. 
So um, PTH, parathyroid, parathyroid hormone action uh, on our osteoclast is actually indirect, as I'm sure you're aware, because uh, the osteoclasts don't actually have a receptor for PTH. So PTH binds to osteoblasts, uh, and osteoblasts increase expression of rank ligand, and then rank ligand binds to rank receptor on the osteoclasts or the pre-osteoclast cells, and then all these pre-osteoclast cells combine to form an, an osteoclast. So kind of, you know, just remember that uh, an osteoclast has a rank receptor, but it doesn't have a PTH receptor. And then just a word about, you know, vitamin D. Um, so that's the other thing, you know, don't confuse, you know, the actions of uh, parathyroid hormone with the actions of vitamin D. <clears throat> um, you might see them all kind of, you know, uh, mixed in together and mentioned together because they're effectively doing the same um, thing as in, i.e. regulating uh, calcium levels. Uh, but the specific thing that vitamin D is doing is kind of increasing, you know, intestinal abs intestinal absorption of calcium. Um, so if you see PTH, you know, PTH increases intestinal absorption of calcium. That's not strictly true. You know, PTH is increasing activity of vitamin D, and it's vitamin D that is increasing activity. Uh, that is, you know, increasing activity of these transport proteins that are causing calcium to enter through the intestine. Um, and I just thought this was, I, I used this diagram actually on vitamin D. I thought it was quite comprehensive um, in, in talking about it. So it might just be useful to kind of go through. Uh, and if you're not already aware, just be aware that when you're talking about, you know, making vitamin D from the sun and all that, it's specifically the UVB uh, rays um, as opposed to UVA, I suppose. Uh, but you know, that, that also has come up in the past when it's talking about UVB radiation specifically. Uh, and then just one final question. Uh, I wouldn't expect you to get this. Uh, I'd be impressed if you did, but it just kind of, you know, um, thinking forward, just, uh, you know, uh, what cation level would you check if you've got hypocalcemia, but it's not responding to calcium and vitamin D supplements? Does anyone know what other level you would check? What other uh, cation? No, I wouldn't expect you to get it. Um, but you know now it's it's magnesium um, because basically magnesium is required for PTH secretion and, and also uh, PTH's actions on target tissues. So, you know, if someone's got hypocalcemia, you've given them calcium, you've given them vitamin D supplements, but they still aren't responding. Probably want to check magnesium levels. And uh, yeah, that, that's it really. Um, I know that wasn't great. The first time, you know, give me a bit of slack. Uh, but hopefully that was a, a quick run through and yeah thank you does, that, does anyone have any questions at all did any of that make sense <laughs> that was really good stop being so harsh on yourself <laughs> yeah yeah that was helpful thank you um uh, there's also kind of just like some feedback uh, which i'd greatly appreciate to know where i can um yeah i can put it in the chat uh, let me just stop sharing. <laughs>